Welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. Oh, I'm so giddy to be able to say this. Your hosts, Chris Honholtz and Richard Story, joining you on September 11th, 2021. Not giddy about the date, not giddy about that at all, but giddy about the fact that my buddy Rich is back. Hi, how you doing, bud? <laughs> hey there, brother. Well, I did finally make it back from my unscheduled sabbatical um, the, the last month. Life has just gotten in the way of being able to join you for the recordings. Nothing really, really, truly major. It's just been a lot of little things. The biggest thing was when <coughs> Hurricane Ida decided to come ashore, my two sons live and work in the New Orleans area. And they weren't able to evacuate prior to the hurricane making landfall, so they rode Ida out at their home. <laughs> and they 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 live together and work together and yes i know that may seem strange in today's age when my sons are both in the mid to late 20s and they're still best friends but i'm i'm thankful to the lord for that <laughs> but um and there's a, another guy that that lives with them they split split expenses and everything but um once the hurricane passed through the lord the lord blessed the little area where they're living at and there was no damage to their homes or anything. They they had uh, a couple of trees fall. Now, we did have a niece whose home got major damage, and they're not able to live in it. That's going to basically have to be rebuilt. But um, besides my two sons, we have several nieces and nephews and their children and other family members that live in that general area. Um, thankfully, out of all of what could have happened, there was no injuries or anything else, just the one home loss. But my, my sons were able to leave the New Orleans area the following day and made their way up here to where we live in North Mississippi. Well, tomorrow would be two weeks from when they lost power. Their area got power back this late yesterday afternoon. So the area they live was without power for nearly two weeks. And I guess they were at the end of the end of the line where, where repairs because most of that area was restored. Power was restored last Wednesday. So I guess they were <laughs> they, they had the <laughs> unfortunate luck of, of being at the end of the line, but they finally got power restored and, and um I heard from them a little while ago and they safely made it back home. They left out this morning for the five or six hour drive and they made it home safely. I just wanted to thank everyone that has prayed for our family and our friends that have been in that area. We've got, you and I have some dear brothers and sisters that live in that area that have dealt with some very strange issues off and on through the course of this with power coming on for two or three days, going off for two or three days, coming on for two or three days, going off for two or three days. <laughs> it's, it's been a really stressful for a lot of people down there oh i'm sure and thankfully you know it's sad when a storm hits and any life is lost but considering the magnitude of hurricane ida the last report i got was i think three people in louisiana lost their life with um hurricane ida related issues so i mean that's bad but it's nothing compared to what the number of lives that were lost when katrina yeah. made landfall but I just wanted to thank everyone for their prayers and patience. And I'm really, really, really glad to be back with my brother Chris this week. <laughs> One small, funny, well, it's to me it's funny. Some of you may find it gross. thing that occurred during this was <laughs> my son's roommate, um, he pretty much just has spent the two weeks at that house with no electricity. And during the course of cleanup around the house and everything else, they discovered that their turkey fryer got left out in the yard and it and the pot filled with water. <laughs> well, at some point in time, a furry critter ended up in that pot, could not get out. And the last I understood, they were looking at spraying bleach oh, in the yard to remove the odor. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's horrible. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, Not just grossed everybody out before yeah. we even started the show good. <laughs> but um, 
the, the, the way it, the story was told to me was a lot funnier than that. But needless to say, you know, we can laugh at things like that sometimes. We can't help it, but we just laugh. But just the the thought of the of it, the smell that bad to where they're going to be having to trying to spray bleach around the yard just to kill the odor. And I think a few people made a comment that are asked. Were they sure that that was the problem, or is it just the fact that that area down there smells horrible to begin with? No. Ouch. <laughs> well, that ought to tell you something yeah, how no, bad no. it was that they actually felt the need to go that much further. <laughs> if it got that much worse. <laughs> oh, man. Right. You have to understand, we're not being mean, but we tease our relatives in Louisiana because of the swamps and the bayous and all the water. And there is, at times, a very, very unpleasant odor that rolls up in certain areas down there. So we we generally tell our family before they come home to make sure they stop at the truck stop and, and bathe with bleach before they make their oh, trip man. home. <laughs> now, every listener we have that lives in Louisiana... Or probably just turned us off. Michelle Leslie, no offense, but you don't actually live there. You're farther north. So um, maybe you'll cut me a little bit of a break. Although I will ask Michelle one thing. Why did her LSU team let UCLA beat them in their opening game? I mean, come on, really? UCLA of all teams? Oh, That's goodness. you, Michelle. What? Well, you know, le- less than less than fifteen minutes into the show, and Rich is already is already starting fights with Michelle Leslie. <laughs> Welcome back, Rich. <laughs> it's football season. This is what Michelle and I do during football season. We mess with one another. Uh, Roll Tide. <laughs> Oh, brother, I will say, number one, it is wonderful to have you back. I, I really feel very awkward talking to myself uh, when, when, I'm t- when I'm, we're recording a, you know, a solo podcast. It is just uh, it's very, very awkward to do. So I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing this without you. I am grateful that you are back. I'm grateful that your family, for all intents and purposes as well, they've you know, obviously endured some some uh a roller coaster period of of, of events so we're we're gra- we're grateful that things are are working out and uh getting back to normal so really everybody that prayed for that we really appreciate that and appreciate your patience while rich was having to take care of family matters and we rich and I have always said that uh, that you know this show comes second to our families our families are our first ministry so thank you for that um uh, I you know I I haven't had nearly as an interesting ride as you've had uh, I I I've just been contending with COVID for the last week and a half. But <laughs> that's that was apparently a bit milder than what, what most people would describe. I, I I'm on, uh, on the last day of my uh, of my ten day isolation and uh, feel pretty decent overall. And uh, thank you for those that uh, I, I didn't make a lot of announcement about it. I, I actually did not find out that I had it until after recording last week's episode. It was rather funny. Um, I had kind of felt uh, head coldish, I guess would it be the best way to describe it. We had some really, really, really bad smoke uh, for weeks up here in, in Northern Nevada, as, as many places did. And I honestly thought the smoke, it, my, my sinuses finally said, I've had enough. And uh, so I really didn't think I was sick. I just, it just, the, the best way I could describe it is kind of feeling like I had a head cold and uh, I, I have to do weekly testing as required by my, you know, my employment working for the state. And uh, it was, <laughs> it was literally after I had uploaded and put, posted out the show that, <laughs> that, that I get the notification. Oh, by the way, your test results from Wednesday came back. Oh, Oh, that's interesting. Uh, apparently I have COVID. <laughs> so, um, God was very gracious. It has been a very mild case, which I'm learning that a lot of people have had similar stories of of how they handled COVID. It was, and I don't mean to please you know. I've, I know some of you that have have dealt with it like really bad, and I, I actually have personal friends who are really bad have had to deal with it. So in no way, shape, or form, trying to uh, minimize it, um, but learning very quickly that 
the overall narrative that it's basically going to kill everyone is not accurate. <laughs> um, that, that many, many people like myself, if not, it may not be the majority, but many people have dealt with it much like I have. So, um, one of those things to do with as you will, but as I said uh, uh, on my post on, on social media, it's, it's, it's not a death sentence for everyone. And, and just because mine was easier than most doesn't mean that people don't deal with a difficult time, but make your decisions not on the narrative, but make your decisions on what the truth is and then with a biblically informed conscience because I did what the Bible actually talks about. I, I quarantined. Once I was sick, I was quarantined. And that's what I did. I obeyed that, got lots of rest, drank lots of water, uh, took vitamin D, took uh, took vitamin C, took zinc, all those things. My wife started loading me up real fast on that. And it was very, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And But we guess what we didn't do? We didn't go out and we didn't impact other people's lives with it. Did the biblical thing. That's, that's the biblical way of handling it. So um, have a biblically informed conscience. Make your decisions that way, as we as we've always said. But uh, grateful to have you back, Rich. It, it's it's um, it's it's never as fun doing this <laughs> unless you're here. So uh, I just want to remind you all: this is a a program of the uh, Christian Podcast Community. We always every episode try to encourage you to go check that out. Uh, always want to ask you to check out our uh, our. Um, I, I keep wanting to say Facebook and Twitter, our website, <laughs> our website at slave to the com, where you can get linked up with everything. You can sign up and, and become a subscriber to it. You can find the links to our uh, Patreon page. You can find the links to our, uh, our store page, which is with uh, doctrinallife.co. Um, it, it, and Rich, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. I'm literally on the countdown for myself. Uh, maybe what, less than three weeks away. Yeah. 19 days. We are now 19 days away from flying out to the G3 conference. And for the uh, first time for many, uh, uh, for many folks, I, I get to actually be with some of you all, you know, I get to, and like first time for many of you folks, as if that's a big treat for you. Uh, <laughs> it's a big treat for me <laughs> is what I should say. The first time I get to meet a lot of you folks. And I'm so looking forward to that. And, uh, I'm going to bring my digital recorder with you, but I can make no promises as to if I can interview anybody. I have no idea what this is going to be like. This is like comic con for theology nerds. So I'm really looking forward to being there, but rich, we got it. Eki Tepsaporchai and Nathaniel Jolly, I, these guys, I, how they thought about this, and I, it just never occurred to me, I don't know, but they've got their own podcast table. Okay, They're going to have a podcast table at G3. What are we thinking that we don't have a podcast table at G3? <laughs> well, for one thing, about all we could display would be a crayon drawing of our logo. <laughs> I mean, we have no backdrops or anything. I guess well, you could hang up a shirt and say, you know, check us out. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, folks. If you want us, and, and this is providing, who knows what everything's going to look like next year. I mean, we've got, you know, uh, His Highness uh, Air Biden, you know, basically trying to uh, dictate to the world how everything, how that you we need to bow down and and. and quit making him so impatient uh so we have no idea what next year will look like but if there is a g3 next year if you'd like us to be there we need some help from y'all because we don't make any money off of this so uh if you th would love to see us make it to g3 and would love to see us have a table josh bice like you're, yeah like he's listening we'd love to have a table there <laughs> um we need to start getting some materials together, which means we've got to start making a banner. We've got to start making uh, stuff that we can share and, you know, maybe having, hey, uh, Josh, doctrinealife.co, you know, maybe some hats would be great. You know, you're telling you know, you know, some other some other goodies on, on the website that maybe we can order and put up there. You know? <laughs> uh, but if you'd love to see us do that, we could certainly use your guys' help putting that together. Um, like I said, we don't make any money on this. And even though we've well, not, you, go, go ahead, brother. You said it was like a theological Comic Con. Couldn't we do like a Comic Con and just charge fifty dollars for a picture, yeah. hundred dollars for an autograph? And, isn't that the way all that normally works? <laughs> I got a funny, fee funny feeling that people wouldn't pay fifty cents, brother. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
In other words, we'd end up having to pay people to take their picture with us. I think that we'd have to pay people uh, ju- just to pretend they actually listen to the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, you know, we do have the Patreon link now. I don't say this to make you feel bad. The page since the Patreon link's been up, nobody's subscribed to it, and that's fine. God continues to provide what is necessary for this show to operate. But the Patreon link is there. So if there's a way that you think maybe you would like us to do that, that's one option. Okay, that's just a, that's a way it can be done. And maybe it's not Patreon. Maybe we got to use something else because Patreon typically means you got to have some extras to give to you. And we're not really good at that. <laughs> we're not good at doing extras. Uh, so maybe we'll figure out a way to make that work better for people. But if you'd love to see us do a table, that we could sure use some help with that. And, uh, you know, that would mean we'd have to start kind of planning now because a year goes by really, really fast. So, <laughs> so any, anyway, anyway, I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing some folks there. Uh, but we got a show to do if we, you know, we have not done this in a long time. We are now 15 minutes into the show and we haven't done the show yet. So <laughs> we, we, we're out of practice. We're, we're getting out of our rhythm. <laughs> we may be just a tad bit rusty. Just a little bit, at least as a team effort. I mean, we, we were, what, an hour and a half into pre-show before we decided, hey, we really need to record an episode. <laughs> yeah, and, and in that hour and a half, I think we spent 10 minutes talking about tonight's show. Yeah, so. that was about it. <laughs> Talked about <laughs> everything just else. For, clarif- <laughs> yeah, for clarification, Chris and I haven't spoke since the last episode we did together. So Which we was had four we weeks had some ago. catching up to do. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, ch- we had some catching up to yeah, do. Yeah. We, we text each other all the time. But yeah, it was the first voice to voice contact we'd had for a little while. So, um, you know, bear with us. We, we might be a little out of the rhythm. So, okay. All right. So let's not torture anybody with a terrible transition since we're so out of practice. <laughs> so I will say this. Go ahead. I will say this. One thing has tracked true. <laughs> and we've done this for the last several years. It seems like whatever happens to one of us, the other one, ha- it happens to the other one. Chris gets COVID, has all these symptoms. In the last couple of days, I start getting sick with a head cold. So I, I, t- I, I had nothing to do with whatever it. it's worth. I, I didn't even talk to you. Okay, we, we texted. So you can't even blame me on this one. Okay. <laughs> well, look. We've had we've had refrigerators break at the same time. We've had washing machines break at the same time. We've had flats at the same time, all within a couple of days. I don't believe in coincidences. I think you are throwing some kind of weirdo Western hex over here. From, you know, I I I, I no. I got, I got I got I got no claim on any of that, man. I can't get my teenagers to obey me the way I'm supposed to. How on earth could I get the you know any energy in this world to act like a hex to affect you? Not that I could to begin with. But it's, and now everybody's gone. They've gone completely pagan. We need to turn it off. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Andrew's fault. It's, Everything is always it's Andrew's always Andrew's fault. fault. I guarantee you, this one is Andrew's fault. He likes to he likes to claim he can listen in and imp- you know, somebody was trying to encourage him. Uh, you know, er, uh, earlier to to crash the show when I put the announcement out, what you notice is Andrew's not here. Andrew keeps claiming, "Oh, I'm going to crash the show." Sure, sure you are, Andrew. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we'll blame him. It's always, it's always Andrew's fault. So that that works really well for me. I like that idea. Oh, one <laughs> other thing, real quick, before we get into tonight's subject, if you have not, go check out our good brothers podcast. Gene Clyde is called Squirrel Chatter. You will be edified by his his podcast that he's rebooted, and it's I just love the description on his podcast about <laughs> the piney woods and and people that are familiar know that Gene is the squirrel Shinar squirrel. Yep, and you know jokes go back about that for years, but. His name of his podcast is Squirrel Chatter. And I, I love his little logo with the squirrel and the microphone. Just don't let him near your iPod, iPad. <laughs> yeah, don't don't let anybody. If you are, especially if you are someone named Phil Johnson, do not let uh, Gene Clyatt near your iPad, and you you'll be just fine. Um, <laughs> but if you if you tune in and listen to Gene's podcast, which I highly recommend. He is such a pastor um, and, and, and so pastoral in what he does. Uh, definitely check out his stuff. It's so good. So very good. But yeah, go, go One and, more. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
one more, one more. I think I saw Alan Nelson post something about a Christmas tree, so that means it's officially <sighs> the start of the Christmas season. Why do you encourage Alan in this? <laughs> we're not we're not even halfway into September yet. We're eleven days in. Eleven days in. Why do you encourage him? Don't encourage him. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it because it reminds me that Christmas is really not that far off. So my wife and I have already just started discussing Christmas shopping. So thank you, Alan. That that helped trigger my memory a bit. Uh, don't encourage him. All right. <laughs> Well, okay. December is going to be busy for oh. our family this year. My my daughter is pregnant with my th- third grandchild, <laughs> and and the due date is December the twentieth. Oh goodness, that poor kid's and not going to have a, cr- to, a Christmas a, a, a good birthday because he's always going to be competing with Christmas. That poor kid. And according according to the sonogram, it will be my first grandson. <laughs> that is too awesome. That is just too too awesome, brother. All right, all right. We got to do a show. We really, really, really have to do a show. Squirrel. <laughs> Gene's fault. This is all Gene's fault. Okay. So that being said, we do have a show to do tonight, and guess what? It won't be about. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not going to be about Joe Biden's uh, you know uh, unconstitutional mandates. It's not going to be about COVID. It's not going to be about the the you know the 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 uh, the, the impact of. Uh, socialism, Marxism, etc., on the world. It's it's actually going to be okay. a theological topic. <laughs> okay, I, I've I've got the setup. Okay, here it comes. Okay, brace yourself, okay, everyone. Okay, everyone. Incoming. Fast forward. It's about twenty years from now. The worst <laughs> case scenario has happened. America has gone full blown socialist. It is now even worse than England. And we look more like China than we do England. Full-blown persecution is underway. Christianity is all but outlawed. Unless you are abiding by government standards as a Christian, meaning that you've got to be supporting abortion and homosexuality and all these other sinful things that our government seems to want to endorse, you cannot be a practicing Christian. So we're setting up the scenario. True, full-blown Christian persecution is underway. Unless you are worshiping according to the government standards, you are breaking the law. How's that? Very dark, and I'm surprised you only gave it 20 years. Uh, <laughs> the way things are going, I I anticipate less than five. Um, but, uh, uh, that that is kind of the 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 reason we're doing that is we want to kind of take away the stigma of our current circumstances, because this is something that I, I propose to Rich because I've been taking time doing, uh, you know, my, my, my daily read right now is First Peter. Um, five chapters of what I think is really, especially living in our current circumstances, brother, um, I think such a challenge to the, the Christian mind and heart because Peter is writing, he, he starts it off in, in verse 1, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are not brethren living in, uh, well, let's just say relative ease. Th- these are Christian brethren who have been dispersed because of persecution. And so they are, not, they are no longer living where they once lived. They no longer have the jobs they once used to have. They no longer are living, if you could say, comfortably, because I'm sure it was still a difficult existence even before this. But they've been cast out, and they've had to you know, eke out new lives in new places. And so he is writing to all these Christians who are under persecution, who are uh, going through tribulation and trial and going through great difficulty. And when he writes to them, it's not a writing about the uh, injustice of what they're going through. It's not a writing of how to contend back for uh, some level of freedom. It's, It's none of those things. What he writes about is how they as Christians should live even in light of this. 
and that's what I One think. Thing. That's why I think it's appropriate what you what you did, kind of setting up the picture, as if to say, imagine twenty years from now, we didn't win the fight, we didn't get the the un, the unjust government off our backs. Imagine it's gotten worse. I, I think that's a great way because it helps us, you know, picture how do we yet still live knowing that. But go ahead, brother. I just wanted to point out also in that setup that. that what I was describing is what many brothers and sisters around the world are going through right now. It's not a matter of when will persecution come. It's a matter of, okay, we've grown up under this persecution in China and other places. Christianity is outlawed. Exactly. So how are they facing the persecution that they're going through? And it's not just a matter of, certain things being an inconvenient it's a matter of jobs lives livelihoods a, a, the ability to feed one's family yes persecution that you look back and see that has happened throughout history but we tend to forget here living in the united states that there are brothers and sisters in parts of this world right now that are going through things probably even worse than what the brothers and sisters that Peter wrote to are going through because, you know, there, there's not a lot (laughs) of real background in this epistle as to what type of persecution some of them are actually experiencing far as if they're facing death or if they're facing being put out of the synagogues, are they facing being, you know, ostracized and all that. But, one thing's for sure, there are brothers and sisters right now that are facing death for professing to be a Christian. Yeah. Now, I know some scholars have debated that Peter wrote this during the time when Saul was ravaging the church, and these were some of the brothers and sisters that escaped from Jerusalem and Israel and went to these other areas. Um, I'm not a theological scholar. I don't know dates. Um, I've not re- studied and researched that portion that in depth yet, but either way, this was Peter wrote to those that are in these areas that are f- facing, you know, more than what we would just consider today as an inconvenience. You know, we, we dealt with all the mask mandates for church and, and all of those issues, and honestly, were just inconveniences compared to what these brothers and sisters were facing and what many brothers and sisters are facing today around the world. Yep. Amen. And so I just, it's important to recognize that the Bible talks about these things. The Bible addresses how we as Christians are to live. And the thing is about this is that while he's writing this to people who are undergoing persecution and who at that time are living much, as you said, Rich, how much of the persecuted church and um, uh, around the world today lives, there are even when we are not facing persecution, what's in these passages are important. So we still we this isn't well because you're being persecuted live this way. This is what he's calling us to do, even under persecution. So this would apply under persecution or not under persecution. You know, we are still called to live a certain way. So the first thing he kind of does right out the gate, and I just want to kind of work through some passages here, is in verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now stop right there for a second. He is writing to people under persecution who have been dispersed into various lands. His first thing is to call them what? To the remembrance of what they themselves are. They are Christians. People who have Christ in his mercy has caused to be born again. That in his mercy, the reason they're being dispersed is because they follow Christ. But what is he called them to? Is it the trials and tribulations? No, it calls them to their faith, to the fact that they are born again in Christ. 
he continues to say, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you in heaven. The first thing he calls them to is God's promise of eternal life, of salvation in Jesus Christ. And that's when he, he starts moving forward and talking about, with that in mind, how we are to view and how uh, these things and how we are to live. He says, it's been kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That very salvation is guarded for us. It is, you can't, it can't be taken away from you. No matter what some uh, man-centered theology tells you, you cannot lose this. Why? Because it's being guarded by God's own power. And then he says, Brother, in, uh, go ahead. I just wanted to point out that this actually mirrors Hebrews 11 mm -hmm. and goes back to something we discussed several weeks ago. Our eternal hope is in Christ. We're striving for that eternal glory with Christ in heaven, just like the Abraham and all the ones listed in Hebrews 11, their faith was in Christ. Their faith was in the hope and the promise even though they didn't obtain that inheritance, it was that hope that we see that inheritance in Christ, that salvation in Christ. They never saw the coming of Christ, but yet they lived by faith in the hope of that eternal kingdom within Christ, meaning that these brothers and sisters that Peter addresses, just like for us, our eternal home, our eternal residence is in heaven with Christ, not this temporary time here on earth. And we need to remember that during the course of our time as brothers and sisters in Christ on earth, we need to remember that our <laughs> eternal citizenship is not in the country where we live, but our eternal citizenship is in heaven glorifying in Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's with that in mind that he then says in verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So he is writing to people who are under persecution, who have been dispersed because of their faith, yet they rejoice even though they are being grieved by those very trials. And he says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We rejoice, even though we're going through trials, because it is proving the genuineness of our faith. Even more so gold. Gold you know, goes through these intense heat so that the impurities can be ri can rise to the surface and be and skimmed off to where you can get this just super pure gold but that heat can destroy even gold if it's too, if it's too hot it can even destroy that yet our faith the genuineness of our faith even in trials is results in praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ our faith cannot be destroyed if it is genuine. The testedness of your faith going through the trials reveals genuinely that we are in Christ, which results in praise, glory, and honor. He, and he finishes this passage by saying, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So his, his big gunshot coming out of the gate is pointing those under persecution back to the promise of salvation. That when all of this comes, they will ob obtain the, out the actual outcome of their faith. They will obtain you know, salvation and they will be with Christ for eternity. Rich, I... I think that is so important that we, we understand that when we are talking about whether we are living in relative ease or we are living under the worst of persecution, the fixation of our heart and our mind should not be 
per se the issues around us, but they should be on the the uh, that outcome of our faith, that salvation of our souls, because that is what I believe Peter uses to then sit down before uh, his readers. This is then, with that in mind, this is how you are called to live. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And actually, throughout the New Testament, um, Paul and Peter both reemphasize how a Christian should respond <laughs> to trials and suffering. Um, you know, throughout several of Paul's epistles, he addresses these same issues. And Peter, in this and somewhat in Second Peter, address how should a Christian respond to trial, suffering, and persecution. And Paul points out, you know, who hopes for what he has seen? Our hope is in Christ who we have not seen. Our hope is in the eternal, not the what we see before us now. And it it's very amazing because how many of us wake up each day thinking, okay, how can I glorify Christ in the suffering that I'm going through? How can I glorify Christ in the, the, the persecution that I might be facing or the persecution I am facing? How many of us get up and actually think and consider for that day, how and what can I do to glorify Christ with my words and in my actions and my conduct? Sadly, most of us, whether you know we've been saved for a year or 50 years, most of us just live the day for the day without ever really truly considering the things of the kingdom of Christ. You know, how many of us truly try to live for things of above and not things for around us? You know, we tend to be very reactionary. And a lot of times, sadly, our prayers only come about after obstacles come up and present themselves to us throughout the day, whether it's someone being sick or a loved one or this tragedy or that tragedy. You know, the Bible commands us to give thanksgiving in all circumstances, and that's rather part of what Peter is alluding to when he speaks about how a Christian should respond to persecution. Do you think so? Yeah. No, absolutely. I think you're absolutely correct. It, that is the motivating factor. It's utterly the motivating factor for all that we then do. And as you said, Scripture is replete with those commandments that this is how and why we should live the way we do. So the thing that I, I when I look at this, Rich, that, that I find so, it was just such, Kind of like it just popped off the page at me as I'm looking at this. And again, this is with everything that the, we're going through right now. I'm looking at this going, wow, this is not what I would expect if you're at the way we talk to one another as we're going through difficulties in this life and the things we're, we're talking about how we're going to react and how we're going to do things. I looked at this and went, that's not what Peter's writing about. The first thing that he does is in the same chapter 1 in, in, in verse 13 is he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, focusing on that promise. And then he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, Rich, they're going through persecution. They're going through persecution because they are Christians. They're going through persecutions because they have turned away from the things of the world and they have clung to Christ as their only hope of salvation. Peter has called them to remember their hope, only hope of salvation. And then he says, be holy. To, you know, to prepare their minds for action. To, you know, as, as the, uh, in the notes in my ESV say, Greek rendering is basically girding up the loins of your mind. 
being sober-minded, he says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, imagine you're going through persecution, that you are being told you are have been chased from your home, you've been chased and to live in other areas of the world, you're away from your family, you're away from the things that you know, you're called to remember that you are to be you are saved in Christ, and the first thing you're told is don't sin. Live in a manner that is not your former way of life. Don't fall back on the things that would allow you to kind of maybe mesh with the world, so to speak. He says, gird up your mind, be sober-minded, and be holy. The first thing he commands them to do is to live righteously. I mean, that's going to make you stand out even more, isn't it? Well, absolutely, because this also alludes back to the other scripture when it when it says, "Repay no one evil for evil." In our former ignorance, the first thing we want to do is seek out vengeance for those that have wronged us or do us harm or cost us money or, or cost us our job. In our ignorance, we want to respond to sin with sin. Mm -hmm. We want to respond in kind, but that's not what Christ commands us to do. He commands us to be forgiving, <coughs> to forgive one another, to be humble, to walk in peace, to walk in holiness, to strive to walk in holiness. Now, honestly, you know, we will never walk in perfect holiness while we're on earth. But as Christians, our desire, our goal should be to strive to walk in as much holiness and as much shadow of Christ as we can. And we can only do that through the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't come naturally for us. We have to be in prayer. We have to be in Bible, in our Bibles, in studying our Bibles. But prayer more so than anything else because you know if you're in prayer how many times has someone prayed a prayer that would be a sinful prayer meaning lord please strike this person down because they did this 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 or this to me no that would be silly i mean if somebody told us they did that we'd, we we would call them out in a heartbeat but no we are to be forgiving to seek to live in peace, to seek to glorify Christ. And this is commanded and taught and told to us in the worst possible circumstances. If we're to act like that when things are horrible and terrible around us, how much more so should we strive for that when things are good? I mean, exactly. how many times or how often do we even think about that? I don't, I don't think enough and, and and honestly peter's letter i look at it and go the fact that he wrote this to them as they're undergoing this to me it's like they needed to hear it because maybe they weren't thinking of it nearly enough as either he's drawing them back he's drawing them back to the the message of the gospel the promise of eternal life and then the first thing that they he out of the gate of that is to say to be holy as Christ is holy. So he's calling them to live in such a way that they are evidencing that they are Christ. I, they, you know, they're, he goes, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was going to ask you to go ahead and get to it because <laughs> he goes deeper. He lays out yep. how, what that should look like, how they should act, how they should respond. In this epistle, he goes deeper. He doesn't just say, well, you should be holy. He lays out what that means, how they should be conducting themselves during the course of these trials and persecutions. Uh, absolutely. When he gets to chapter 2, um, you know, Peter writes, so starting in verse 1, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. So he, he starts them off, you know, as he, you know, with the commands, he's telling them, don't do the things that the world does. Speak with truth. Get rid of the, the anger and the hate. Don't be hypocritical. Don't envy others. Don't slander others. And then he gives them the tool to do that. He says, 
like newborn infants long for pure spiritual mur- uh, excuse me pure spiritual milk that it is that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good desire pure spiritual milk where where are we getting that from the word of god go back to the word of god the way you don't fall back is that you're you're feeding on the very words of God. That is what gives you life. And he reminds them that they're, they're this, they're, they are, when they come to Christ, the living stone rejected by men, they're being built up as a spiritual house. So they're feeding off of what Christ has given them through, through the prayers, through the, you know, the study, through the obedience, through re- relying upon the Holy Spirit. They're being built up as a spiritual house. And he says, you know, he goes in verse seven to say, it is uh, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So you're a spiritual house. You're being built up. Christ is the cornerstone, but for the world, he's a stumbling block, a rock of offense. And then he says, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So he's pointing, he's making this contrast. You are being built up. You are found, uh, you know, put together with Christ as the cornerstone, but they, the world, stumble over Christ. They're offended because of Christ, and they're disobedient because they're destined to do so because they have not Christ. But then he says about these Christians, which is applicable to all Christians, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, that you may what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but you are now God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So he's telling them to leave behind the things of the world, to not act as the way of the world because they're not the same as the world. They are unique, called out, set apart for a specific purpose. We are called out. We are built up as this spiritual uh, you know, building, this spiritual temple, so to speak, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of Christ. Our obedience, our rejection of sin and our obedience to Christ is because we are a unique people called out so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us into the light. We are no longer our own. We no longer belong to the world. We belong to Christ and we've been made that. We've been made to be a unique people. So then he says, to uh to to them that it with all of this in mind he 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 goes into this uh into this moment of uh y- y- these are things that you guys need to do this is what you know you need to be called to and so he says I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul. So, abstain from sin. Turn from sin. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Okay? So, not only abstaining from sin, but interacting with the very people who are those who are destined to disobey God. Those who see him as a stone of offense, of a stone of stumbling. They are called to act honorably to the very people who are causing them tribulation. Why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Those who are bringing tribulation, those who are bringing persecution, who speak evil of these Christians. The very people Peter says act honorably to. Why? Because they're going to see it. They're going to see the good deeds of those in Christ. And even though they've been speaking evil of them, on the day that God comes in judgment, God is glorified because his people were obedient to him. His people, no matter what the world called them, 
honored him. His people acted with love and kindness and mercy and not sinning against the world. Then he goes one better. Okay, remember, these are people under persecution. Persecution sometimes was state sanctioned, right? You may have had local governments. You may have had the Roman government involved. But what does Paul, Peter tell these Christians to do? Verse 13, be subject. You know, this is, by the way, still in chapter 2. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor a supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. I know this is contentious in this day and age, but just hear us out. For Verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, Think about that for a minute, folks. Think about what he just said. Not only are, t- are t- they, j- the, these Christians to act honorably to the very people who may be speaking them as evildoers, but he's also saying, be obedient to the government in those places where the government has authority. And we've talked about that before with how Romans 13 is applied. And even here, that the government does have a realm. The government, for example, can't tell the church, don't come together. The, the government can't tell you, you must have an abortion. The government can't tell you, stop worshiping in the name of Jesus Christ. And those are like kind of obvious uh, explanations that obviously we can get into further, but we're not going to get into that right now. The point is, the government has its role. And when the government says, you can't do X, Y, Z in the name of God, the Christian is not obligated to be obedient to the government in those realms. We've talked about that. But however, on that day-to-day living, paying your taxes, driving the speed limit, not stealing, you know, being honest on your taxes, um, you know, not hurting others, being obedient and being under the authority of the government, even an oppressive government, even in a, a government that seeks to it seeks to desire to cause persecution for you. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Government can sanction persecution. Government can inspire persecution. Yet, the Christian is called to obey the government, at least in those areas by which we, the government has been given authority. Why? Why would God say that? Why, why would Peter command them? So why? For the very, uh, for, he says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Rich, when we are being obedient to the government, when we pay our taxes, when we obey the speed limit, when we're doing all the things that we that we are to do as obedient citizens even under an oppressive government it's a testimony that we honor god because god has called us to do this does that sound right oh absolutely and we need to keep in mind that regardless of the authority over you because each one of us submit submits to some form of authority whether being younger, whether it's our parents, whether it's our employer, our pastor, our mayor, our governor, or president, if those people placed in that authority will answer to God on the day of judgment, whether that person honored God in the role of authority they are given, or if they dishonor God in the role of authority, they will be held accountable to God because in God's sovereignty, God allows that person to be in that position of authority no matter what level it's at. And say like the president, with the authority that is given to the president, he will be held to a higher standard because he's responsible for more people. And it's God that judges. It's God that will incur vengeance. The Bible tells us, you know, that vengeance is the Lord's. And we need to remember that if we have a 
bad governor or a bad president, they will be held accountable mm-hmm. to God on the day of judgment. But we will also be held accountable for our responses to the way that they misuse their authority. So, like, if if a president misuses their authority, if we respond in a sinful manner, we will be held responsible for our sinful response, just like they will be held responsible for their sinful use of their authority. Mm. And that's what Peter is commanding and pointing out, that each person will be held accountable for their own words and deeds. And when someone does something evil or does something against us, it goes back to what Christ said, that we are to repay no one evil for evil, but we are to forgive one another. That forgiveness means even if they don't ask for forgiveness, we are to automatically to forgive them because we have been forgiven in Christ for our sins and our indiscretions and for everything. And I know that some people will say, well, I'm not going to do this, this, or this because their motivation is evil. (laughs) Well, let me ask you this. Would you reject salvation because it was evil to crucify Christ? Was Was it not evil motives that sent Christ to the cross, but yet we benefit because of those evil motivations? Because the Bible says what they intended for evil, God uses for his glory and his good. And the same thing applies even when we are under the authority and under the rule of an evil government or an evil leader, no matter what level they're at. God will use that evil for his glory. He allows things to transpire for our good and for his glory. And I know you haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but... When it comes to suffering, trials, and persecution, it is for our good and for Christ's glory that we endure such things. And Christ is glorified in our response in those situations. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It, it, you know, it's, and what's funny is, as Peter is writing this out, he, he starts with how we act toward like the world at large. Then he brings it down and saying to every human institution. And then he says something else. You said we're under various forms of authority. Well, he takes it even, brings it down even tighter. And he says, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, we don't live in a time, at least in Western nations, that we are having to live with uh, you know the servant master relationship you know the bond servant to the 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 slave owner but we have bosses we have employers we have people that who, under who we must do work and are held accountable to and he says not you're to, to you're to serve them with all respect not only to the good and gentle but also to the unjust now, I, I got to tell you, that's a challenge. I mean, every one of us has a boss we can't stand. Every one of us has been in a company or a department that they, they run the place like, a, you know, well, as if it was Joe Biden in the White House. Uh, they, 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 they're, Actually, they're, I've had some worse than that. <laughs> but I mean, they run it as tyrants. And yet he says, be subject to this. Why? For this is a gracious thing. This, By the way, this is verse 18, now 19 in chapter 2. For this is a gracious thing when, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. It, it's, it's an act of grace that while as we keep our mind focused on God, we are enduring those unjust sorrows. It's an act of grace. We are showing grace. What credit is it to, uh, if when you sin, you're beaten for it, you endure. So if you mess up, if you don't do your job right and you, you violate policy or procedure or you basically fail to show up to work or whatever, you mouth off to your boss and you get disciplined. Okay, so you own it. Big deal. You got in trouble and you own the, the discipline. Okay, so what? That's what you earned. But he says, 
But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. In other words, we are showing grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. We're enduring unjust treatment for God's sake. And he says, for this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. So Christ, who had every reason to be to stand against hit the unjust treatment, the false trial, the false accusations, the false witnesses, uh, you know, being brought before Pilate, who recognized no crime did he commit, that he was guiltless, yet he speaks not a word. Why? Because there was a reason he went there to endure the shame and the cross. But he also did it as an example for us. Now, mind you, we are speaking of people who are enduring suffering primarily because of their claim to, to be followers of Christ. So a servant who is a Christian who is enduring unjust treatment uh, because of being a Christian is definitely showing testimony of his faith. And I think that's primarily what we see being demonstrated here when he says, when you suffer unjustly, but I think there has great, a, a, a broader, I shouldn't say greater, but a broader application, even when it's not that you're suffering because of a Christian, but because you're just suffering unjustly. Now, does that mean that you can't report it to HR? No, of course you can. Does that mean you have to stay in a, in a horrible job? Of course not. If you have the ability to leave, you can. But what he's saying is rather than acting as the world where you don't do your job or you rebel against or you get into the fight with the boss or whatever it is, he's saying there's this graciousness that you demonstrate that is that has been demonstrated for you in Christ, because he himself could have justified himself, could have stood against the uh, injustice of it all, but he didn't. He did that for a reason so that we might be redeemed, yet it is our example that we, hey, act, uh, we act with graciousness and serve our masters with all respect. Go ahead, brother. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the scenario with an unjust boss. I know this because I have experienced and, and heard it from people that had a <laughs> very contagious, contentious boss or a company and they're aggravated and upset and there's really nothing they can do, no one to report it to. So they think, well, since I'm treated so unfairly and I have to go through so much and what I'm being asked to do is so unfair, I deserve this, this, or this, whether it's stealing office supplies or fudging on their time card or, you know, calling in sick when they're not sick just because they want a day off. Or if it's, you know, any other numerous things, you are not honoring Christ by that because you're thinking you deserve to be treated better because X, Y, and Z. The thing is, in this life, we deserve nothing except mm -hmm. judgment for our sins. And when you, when you elevate your own, when your pride elevates your opinion to the point to where you're saying, well, I deserve better, I deserve this, I deserve that, you're not thinking the way Christ taught or commands us to think. We're not to respond with evil. We're not to respond in a sinful manner especially if we have done nothing wrong. And whether it is happening because you're a Christian or not, if you are in Christ, you are a Christian, which means regardless of the why, you are to respond as Christ commands us to respond during times of hardship, trials, or suffering, or unjust circumstances. We've got to remember that. And I think being Americans... Being a Christian in America, many people many times confuse their rights under the Constitution mm -hmm. under what, you know, they confuse that with what God commands us to do. Our authority is under the law of love from Christ, not the Constitution. Now, as Americans, we have certain legal 
rights and certain legal ways to, you know, counteract and fight against certain circumstances, but we are to never to respond in a sinful manner. Right. Sadly, many times it's pride that is the response seeking vengeance, even in a legal way, versus trying to seek out justice, not only for our circumstance, but for the brothers and sisters around us. That makes sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing. I, I, you've, you've made an excellent point. There's nothing about what we're saying here that we can't stand against injustice, but it's the whole idea that, number one, we don't do so sinfully. You absolutely nailed that. You know, And I, I think the idea that we can justify behavior because it is a we see it as a proper reaction to an unjust boss and unjust government if it does not if we if we cannot go to the word of god and clearly in my opinion clearly be able to point to where scripture justifies doing x y or z we need to really really think about why we're acting the way we are but even with that in mind what is the command of Scripture here? That we are called to endure sorrow even when it's unjust because it's an act of grace. We are actually acting in a manner consistent with our Savior. And we are probably have to have to go more into this maybe more next week. I, this is going a little bit longer than I wanted to, but let, let me let me just kind of bring a, a couple last points into this, and then Rich will 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 give everybody a break because I know this is this is heavy stuff. This is like this is probably mind blowing because it was mind blowing for me as I sit down, and I don't believe that we are being inconsistent with the text. We're not trying to say something that the, the text doesn't say. We're not trying to say. Um, we just need to be sheep and we just need to lay down and be mistreated and be willing to accept that. We're not saying that. What we're saying is Peter writing to people in persecution who have been dispersed, who have been sent packing, who have been living in trials and tribulations, he has called in the writing of this epistle to say to you who are undergoing all this, Remember who you are. Remember that you are called in Christ Jesus. You ha- you are a unique, chosen people here for the express purpose to proclaim the ex- excellencies of Christ. So with that in mind, be holy. Don't act as the world does. Be subject to human institutions. Honor the emperor. Serve your masters with all respect, and even endure unjust treatment without having to get into some sort of uh, fisticuffs about how bad you've been treated because when you endure sorrow graciously, you are acting as your Savior did. I mean, that is mind-blowing, We are called to be a unique people. That is not, does any of that sound like anything that the world does, Rich? Absolutely not. And and that's the clarifier. We are to respond differently than the world. The world would expect someone to respond with, you know, (coughs) well, uh, you know, griping and mumbling and, and, contention and especially those of us you know have grown up in the united states that we take our liberty and freedom so seriously that a lot of times sadly we put that above the way that christ commands us to respond to unjust situations and it's a very hard fleshly struggle for most of us you know, and and like you said, we're not talking about just being a complete pacifist and just laying down and taking anything and everything under the sun. Thankfully, we live in a country to where we have legal means to respond to things. But even then, 
we we need to check our motives and make sure that when we respond to unjust situations, we're not responding out of vengeance, but we're responding because we have a care and concern for our families and those around us. Because if you're in a situation, whether it's the government <coughs> or for you know other people, you know, put it down, bring it closer to home. You're in a job that you're having to endure unjust treatment, but because of your family and your setting and situation, you've got to deal d deal with these situations. And how we respond reflects our relationship with Christ and reflects to the world how Christians should respond. Because if you're a Christian and your response to these situations, it should look completely different than what, you know, your neighbor, mm -hmm. the way they would act or respond. I mean, I know it's hard. That's one reason I, I kind of want to take this a little farther and flesh this out a little deeper. Um, and in closing for tonight, I want to leave the listeners with a couple of things to think about that we will address going deeper into this next week. Not only is it a matter that, you know, the Lord gives us discipline for our good and for our sanctification. We endure trial, suffering, and persecution at times because it is the will of God to sanctify us. But we also have to stop, and if we're going through something, we also have to stop and look and ask and judge ourselves and examine ourselves and ask, Am I suffering what I'm going through because of my own sin or am I doing it because this is just the situation I happen to be in? Yeah. More, a lot of times we suffer because of our own sin and not because we are Christians. And if we're suffering because of our own sin, then we need to go to Christ in repentance and examine ourselves and examine our walk. And aside from that, I would like to put this question out to you, Chris, and to the listeners. The last time you went through something and the Lord was disciplining you or the Lord was using the situation to sanctify you, when that was over or that situation resolved, or even during that situation, did you stop and ask, Lord, what are you wanting me to learn from this? Did you stop and thank the Lord for loving you enough to put you through that discipline, through that fire, because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. And that is something that we never think about, is thanking the Lord for the discipline that he imposes upon us for our good and for our sanctification. That's just kind of something I want to leave hanging out there until next week. Amen. Amen. I, I, it's, it, and that's such an important question, too. And, and, and you make an excellent point, Rich. I mean, what what is the emphasis of Peter in this in this particular epistle? He is talking about he says over and over again, so that they will see your works, and they even though they speak evil of you, God you know they will glorify God in the day of visit, visitation. In other words, our it's not just our verbal testimony though that is massively important. But it is how we live. If, if, if you are suffering because of sin, and that's why he points out in servants how they uh, live before their masters, is if you suffer for doing wrong, that's what you get. That's what you've earned. But if you suffer even though you've done rightly, you've suffered unjustly, then the person who's done this to you, they are the ones God will condemn on the day of visitation and your gracious kindness and your obedience will be a testimony to God's glory. Here was someone that as a follower of Christ was repentant of their sin, who turned from the ways of the world, who lived in such a way as the those who were around them understood this was a person being 
in obedience to Christ, even though they've been persecuted, even though they've been chased from their homes, even though they've endured trial and tribulation, they are still being obedient to God. And with all of that, then they're obedient to the human institutions. They're honoring the emperor. They're obeying the laws. They're paying their taxes. And in their workplace, they're honoring their master. In fact, look at this guy. He didn't even do what he was accused of. And look at him enduring that suffering and still showing up and still doing the job. What is that a testimony to? The glory of God. Because only, be, only because we have been changed by Christ, only because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, only because we are His for eternity and we've been changed and we're new creations and we're informed by the Word and we're in this intimate prayer with, the, with uh, our Savior and we live lives of obedience, only can that be the case. There's no other explanation. It is a working testimony, a lived out testimony of the power of the gospel in the life of a Christian. Because as Rich said, this is wholly different from how the world reacts. This is entirely, completely different. And Peter is saying, be holy. Be holy because God is holy. Live holy righteously. And then he's taking us through these various demonstrations of what that looks like. Because we are, by not only by what we say, but what we do, we are proclaiming the excellencies of Christ. This is mind-blowing when you stop and think about it. And it has been kicking my backside every day that I've been reading this. It is a challenge because I think this is not what I want to do. I want to I want to holler and scream at the world about how unjust it is. I want to demand my rights in the workplace. I want to say how cruel the world is. And yet I'm called to live a life where I am showing I am being honorable to the very world that hates me because I'm an obedient Christian. And so instead of getting to shake my fist back at them, I'm called to live honorably among them, love them, and serve with excellency. <laughs> Rich, that's, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, really the says, hard. The Lord resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Amen. And that's what this is leaning to leading towards is living a life in humble obedience to Christ. And that, and it's because it is in obedience to Christ. It's not about me. It's about Christ. And I think that's what we, when we look at passages like this, we have to understand. That's why he starts off with that cannon shot out of the gate about that, that, undefiled and perfect uh, salvation that's laid up for us for an eternity and it's being guarded by God himself. He says, this is what you have. What could be greater? What does the world have to offer that can be better and what can it do to you to take it away? If there's not joy in that, I don't know where, what it, what, where you find joy. And I think that's the motivation. That's why he shoots that massive cannon right out of this, the gate to say, hey, by the way, all of you dispersed peoples, remember this? And then he starts talking about how then we should live. And definitely, you know, God willing, Rich, we need to you know, take some more time to go through this next week, um, unless some other topic becomes more important because obviously there's a lot going on in the world right now and there may be a need to to address other issues but leave with this in mind as as we, as we let you go tonight you are a redeemed trophy of God's grace you are a unique people you have been called out of this world you're being built up as this holy structure with Christ as the cornerstone and you're called to proclaim his excellencies because of what he's done. So how you live 
is a massive testimony to that. It is a massive testimony to that. And it, it totally and completely is counter-narrative to the world. It is counter-cultural. It is counter-narrative. And that is why I believe Peter writes this. Take that with you this week as we look at the insanity of the world around us. As we go, the republic is falling. Persecution is looming. Unjust uh, you know, government is, uh, is upon us and all of these things. Live as though, as Rich just said, it's 2041 and everything's gone. And yet, like those of the dispersion, you're called to live righteously. You are called to live righteously in a time of tribulation. Rich, any last thoughts before we let everybody go tonight? Well, one thing that would be more beneficial for our brothers and sisters to be doing more so than anything else is whatever you do, make it a point to proclaim the gospel at least once a day. Amen. Amen. Find someone who needs to hear the gospel this week and proclaim it to them. Please, please, please. And then live as someone whose hope is not in the things of this world, but is in Christ. Please, please, let that be your motivation, motivating joy this week. It's hard. It's been a struggle for me to read through this. But it's so important and it's so valuable. Spend time in 1 Peter this week. That's my challenge to you. Spend time in 1 Peter reflecting how can I live righteously in a world of tribulation. So we thank you for being with us this week. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing Rich back. <laughs> so glad to have you back, brother. Uh, we pray for you guys. We're grateful for you guys. Uh, we pray that the Lord blesses you mightily this week. And uh, whatever you do this week, do it for the glory of God. God bless you guys. Good night. We'll see you next time.